Okay, so now the second part of the background lecture is some of the key theorems from Calc 1. So we have the intermediate value theorem, intermediate value theorem, which since we're lazy, we abbreviate IVT. Uh, the two theorems I'm going to describe right now basically fall under the heading of blatantly obvious mathematics. These are things that drive my brother, who's an engineer, nuts. Is, you, know, you spend your time proving results like this? Yes. Uh, there are some situations where very reasonable things turn out to be false. And so it is worthwhile to make sure you are building on a firm foundation. The other thing is the intermediate value theorem and the mean value theorem, one of its consequences, are incredibly powerful. And so I want to just emphasize a little bit what we can get from these. So it says the following. Let f be a continuous function. Then all values between f of a and f of b are attained in the interval a, b. Okay, so converting from math speak to a picture, here's time A, here's time B. Let's say at time A, I'm two miles from home. At time B, I'm ten miles from home. I claim if I walk continuously, at some point in time, I must have been seven miles from home. All right, let's assume not. So assume I am never seven miles from home. I have to somehow walk from two to ten without crossing this line continuously. So sadly, we do not have the transporters of Star Trek working today. The Heisenberg compensators have broken down. Right? So I'm walking, that's actually how they work in Star Trek. I'm walking like this, I'm trying to come in like this. There's no way to link up without crossing this line. In a continuous manner. I could jump over the page and say all of a sudden, okay, I go from here and I jump up to here. Well then my function's not continuous. I have a jump discontinuity. So, if I want to get there in a continuous manner, I have to cross 7. I also have to cross 654, 6.2397. All of those numbers I have to cross. This is a very hand wavy proof. You know, I'm drawing things on the board, I'm talking about Heisenberg compensators from Star Trek that don't exist. Okay? You can make this very rigorous in analysis class. But the general principle should be clear. You know, to get from point A to point B, if you're walking on a line, you, know, you have to go through all the intermediate points. That's the intermediate value theorem. Okay. One of the most important consequences of this is the mean value theorem. And so what's nice about being on the blackboard is I can just erase that and replace it with mean and change the i to an m. So now we have the mean value theorem. And again, in all of these theorems, you need to make sure you understand the conditions. One of the most common sources of errors is appealing to a theorem or a result when the conditions are not satisfied. So the conditions say, let f be a continuous differentiable function. And let's assume f prime is continuous. I'm, in this class, I'm not going to worry about proving things in the greatest possible generality. I will prove things or say things in general enough result to be useful for most of the cases you'll need to study. Then there is a C between A and B such that F of B minus F of A over B minus A is F prime of C. So again, whenever you see something like this, you want to convert from math speak to some kind of picture that makes sense. So if I think of f as distance, and I think of my input variable as time, and this is how far I've traveled in the elapsed time. Oh, this is my average speed. And over here, this is my speed at c. So what I'm saying is there is no way to travel such that you're never traveling at the average speed. At some point in time, you're traveling at the average speed. Does that seem reasonable? So let's take some strange cases. Um, I'm about to do a lot of traveling in the next few days. I'll choose a legal number like 50. 
let's say my average speed is 50 miles per hour. And let's say at every moment in time, I look at my odometer and my speed is greater than 50. Could my average speed be 50? No. What can you tell me about my average speed? It's got to be higher than 50. For every moment in time you're traveling faster than 50 miles per hour, your average is not 50. Okay? If every moment in time my speed was below 50, my average can't be 50. Alright? So there's basically two cases left. At every moment in time I'm traveling at 50 miles per hour. Okay? If I'm always traveling at 50 miles per hour, can you find a time when I'm going the average speed? Yeah, any time works. So the only other possibility is, at some point I'm traveling below 50, at some point I'm traveling above 50. Ah, the intermediate value theorem. Right? And so there's a reason why I did IVT before MVT. It's not just alphabetical. Uh, using that, at some point, we have to hit the 50 miles per hour. So again, right now, you know, we've talked about the intermediate value theorem. We've shown it leads to something called the mean value theorem. You should be thinking, who cares? Okay? And if ever throughout the class, you know, you get to something and you're going, who would care about this? Why would anybody use that? Ask me. You know, we only have 12 weeks. We have to be very careful in terms of what material we include. A lot of this is because many of you are going to be going to different classes from here. And we have to make sure we cover certain things for the physics classes, uh, certain things for the math classes, uh, certain things for the economics classes. Okay. So one of the reasons that this is so important comes into approximating functions. And we'll talk about this when we get to Taylor series. <coughs> approximating functions. This is like an application of the mean value theorem. So if you remember the function we had to differentiate, uh, 4x cubed sine of cosine of x to the 2011 power. This is not a fun function to work with. What we want to do is basically take whatever function you give me and convert it to a line. Straight lines are easy to work with. And so the idea is no matter what function you give me, I'm going to break my analysis into studying a straight line and then somehow piece those lines together in a good manner. So for instance, if I want to figure out you know, where I'm going to be at a given amount of time, so let's say I'm in my car, I'm driving from somewhere to somewhere, where do you think I am at the start? I've told you no information, you have absolutely no idea. I, let's say now I tell you where I start. And so let's say at time zero, I know I'm five miles from home. Where do you think I am a few moments later? What's your best guess? Given the information, what's the only thing you can guess? Has to be five miles. You don't know which way you're driving. You don't know if you're heading towards home or away from home. So your best guess of if the only information I give you is at time zero you're five miles from home, I guess for all eternity, I am five miles from home. Okay, probably not what the real world is like. So let's say I give you one more piece of information. So in addition to telling you where I am at time zero, what other piece of information would you like? Direction. Direction. It can be even a little bit more Faster. How fast, right? You know, you're one of my students, I'm happy to give you the full vector. <laughs> okay, so now let's say I tell you I'm traveling two miles per hour, I'm speeding, um, away from home. Where would you guess I am one hour later? Seven. And so, you know, the best guess you would have now is a straight line. So if you have some information as to how fast we're traveling, now, of course, if you keep this up, you know, in 15 years, you would have probably an unreasonable prediction as to where I am. We don't expect information like this to be accurate for long periods of time, but for small periods of time, it should do a good job. And so the idea is, if I give you some kind of function, so here I am at A, here's F of A, here's my tangent line with slope f prime of a, then this tangent line should do a really good job of approximating my function if I'm close to a. So we're using words like really and close. Okay? These are words that have to be quantified a little bit more. And so we want to say, if I'm within so much of a, 
How much will my error be? We can do stuff like that and the mean value theorem will help. So let's draw the tangent line. <coughs> y minus y1 is m x minus x1. And so the point, we have the point a f of a, and we have the slope f prime of a. So using this information, we get the tangent line is y minus f of a is f prime of a times x minus a. Well, a much better way of writing this is y is f of a plus f prime of a x minus a. This is where I start at time a. This is the elapsed time, and this is assuming my speed is constant. What kind of information would you want to get a better estimate? So instead of knowing just your, your, where you are and your speed, what would be the next piece of information you would want? So someone who's taking like a physics class. Acceleration. Acceleration. How fast is the speed changing? So the more information I give you, the more accurately I should be able to predict where I am. Of course, there's a trade-off. This will no longer be a straight line. This will now be a parabola. And I can find the best parabola to my curve. And the more I use, the better I can do. How many of you have heard of the birthday problem? Or the birthday paradox? So if you assume all days of the year are equally likely to be someone's birthday, how many people do you need to have in a room before you have at least a 50% chance of two people sharing a birthday? So clearly if I have 367 people, there's only 366 possibilities for a birthday. Two people have to share a birthday. You only need around 22 people to have at least a 50% chance of people sharing a birthday. The number is much smaller than you would expect. One way to attack problems like this is to quickly approximate complicated functions with straight lines. So this idea of approximating complex functions with simpler ones is extremely powerful. Now why is this related to the mean value theorem? What we're going to do is we're going to manipulate the mean value theorem a little bit. So the mean value theorem says f of x minus f of a over x minus a is f prime of c. So f of x minus f of a is f prime of c times x minus a. Or f of x is f of a plus f prime of c x minus a. Notice these are almost identical. The only difference here is I'm evaluating at some intermediate time and over here, I'm evaluating at time A. So the mean value theorem is exact. This is what the answer is. This tangent line approximation, I can now measure the error between them. The error is going to be f prime at some intermediate point C minus f prime of A times x minus A. x minus A is small, so if my first derivative isn't changing much, this is going to be a good approximation. All right. So there's only one last thing I want to do for the uh, Calc 1, Calc 2 review. I want to quickly review optimizing. So you know, if anybody here is in economics, then this is one of the most important things you're going to have to do. You have some function of many parameters, and you want to figure out where's the optimal value. Now, unfortunately, in Calc 1, you only allow yourself to have functions of one variable. So let's say I give you some function f of x. How do I find candidates for maximum or minimum? So we're derivative zero. So critical points, that's where the derivative is zero. Okay. Why is this the case? Well, let's look at something like this. F prime of x is the limit as h goes to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Let's say f prime of x is 5, which is, which is greater than 0. If h is positive and small, and the limit is positive, then f of x plus h has to be greater than f of x. So if the first derivative is positive, I have to be increasing to the right. Conversely, if h was now negative, and the limit is positive, then I would need f of x plus h to be less than f of x. So if the first derivative is positive, you're increasing to the right and decreasing to the left. This can't be a maximum. So this is another interpretation of the first derivative. 
If the first derivative is positive, the function increases to the right and decreases to the left. Okay? So what's the only thing left to have a uh, critical, to have a maximum or minimum? What must be true? So if I, if I want a maximum or minimum, what's the only thing that could happen? So if f prime is positive at that point, could this be a maximum? So if f prime of x is 5, could this be a maximum? No. I could just go a little bit further, right? If f prime is negative, could this be a maximum? No, go backwards a little bit. Unfortunately, you have forgotten something. And so, uh, I'm actually quite happy for this not to be caught on tape, but if you want, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have this taped. Alright, try to find where my speed is largest. Was f prime largest? I'm sorry, was f prime zero where my speed was largest? When I crashed into the wall. So why does that not contradict this? My speed was fastest when I crashed into the wall. So when I'm looking for places for maximum and minimum to optimize, it's not just the critical points you have to <coughs> check. You also have to check the boundary. So over here, if I was allowed to go past B, my function is still increasing. But there is a painful wall there. I also did this earlier today, so this is like the third or fourth time, right? Even though my function has a positive derivative here, if I don't allow myself to go back past B or to go before A, that doesn't matter. How many boundary points are there to check? So this isn't, you know, how many boundary points do we have? Two. Is it that painful to check two points? So you can just find all the places where f prime of x equals 0 and then check the two boundary points and see which one is largest, which one is smallest. Ah, calc 1 is nice. Alright, let's say we now do calc 2, I'm sorry, calc 3. So now, maybe this is our region and we want to see where's the temperature largest. So we can look for all places maybe where the generalized derivative is 0 as well as the boundary. How many points are on the boundary? a lot more than two. Right? We now have infinitely many points on the boundary. So this is why multivariable calculus, it's a little bit harder to find optimal values than it is in Calc 1, Calc 2. In Calc 1, Calc 2, there's only two boundary points to check. Here we have infinitely many, and we have to develop techniques to handle stuff like this. All right, so hopefully this gives you, you know, a sense of what kind of prerequisites you need, uh, what kind of material we're going to be using from Calc 1, Calc 2. Uh, most of the time, Multivariable calculus, when you have complicated integrals, it's just do integrals from 104 many times over. Break it up into lots of simple integrals. There are a few new features that arise when we start doing multivariable integration. Uh, basically, change of variables becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, in the beginning of the semester, I'm going to be emphasizing more things from Math 103. You know, derivatives, those rules like that. But we're going to spend a lot of time on vectors, equations of lines and whatnot, because we need to set notation. So if you have any questions, of course, you know, please let me know. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the semester.